of the story is taken from Acts 2, verses 18 through 21. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and bellows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, last Sunday, we started on this series about Jesus' last words from the cross. And last Sunday, I mentioned when we were talking about forgiveness, that it's much easier to preach about it than it is to practice it. As we prepare for Easter, we are focusing on these seven messages from our Savior as he hung on the cross that day. Last week, we listened to these penetrating words of grace. <coughs> Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We pointed out that Jesus' first message is prophetic fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 12. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The second cry today from Luke 23, 43. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus reaches out to a sinner in his last minutes on the cross, he fulfills another prophecy from that same scripture, Isaiah 53, 12. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. You know, the Roman soldiers who set up the crosses that day didn't really pay attention to how they were arranged. That wasn't on their mind. But God had decreed that he who was most holy would die that day with those who were most You know, God wanted to demonstrate the depths of shame to which his son was willing to descend. At his birth, he was surrounded by beasts. Now in his death, he's surrounded by criminals. So let's take a closer look today at what actually happened on those three crosses. The two men with Jesus were hardened criminals. They deserved to die for what they had done. They both had black sheets as long as their arms. They were on the list of Jerusalem's most wanted. It actually was quite a coup for the authorities to have them strapped to crosses that day on execution hill. As bad as they were, though, they represent each one of us here today. That kind of sounds harsh. We don't like to think this way. But if we're honest, we have to admit that we have all robbed God and that we all live in rebellion to this law. We have broken that law time and time again. We have ignored God and done just what we wanted to. We have become self-centered. We have put God out of our minds. You and I steal, steal from God the thing that is most important to Him. Our lives. While we may not be criminals in the sense of the word, we have all rebelled against God's law. His grace law that's found in Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's all he asks of us. 
When we withhold ourselves from him by leading selfish lives, we are, in essence, criminals. We are stealing from him. Romans 3, 23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because we have fallen short and missed the mark of God's perfection, we are all condemned before God. Hard words to hear. We have ignored the demands of God, just, just like the thieves on those crosses that day. God's commands have broken us. It seems like no matter how hard we try, we cannot meet the standards and expectations. When we come to grips with our sin, with our own sinful condition, then we become candidates for salvation. Yeah. Did you hear that? When we come to grips with our sins, when we admit that, and only then do we become candidates for salvation. If we don't recognize our sins, we will be like the one on the cross that went to his death, shaking his fist at God and cursing him. You know, we're all going to die. And the sooner we accept this fact, the better off we're going to be. We all know from Matthew 27 and 44 that both of the criminals started out that day casting curses and foul language at Jesus. They unleashed their bitterness, their pain, and their agony. They unleashed it on Jesus, who had done no wrong. It doesn't seem right that these two would taunt and mock the one hanging on the middle cross. Jesus was not responsible for what they were going through. And yet, we often do the same thing, don't we? We allow bitterness to take root in our lives. And we lash out at God, thinking God is to blame for what we are going through. Struggles and difficulties allow us two choices. We can become bitter, or we can become better. We can grow through these difficulties, or we can choose to shrivel up and become angry towards others and toward God. So let's go back to the crosses that morning. While two of the criminals lash out at God and revile him, what did Jesus do? Jesus did not yell at them. He did not scold them. He just took in their anger, their pain, their frustration. He knew that people in pain can get better. So a question for you all this morning. Is anyone out there this morning in pain? Do you feel that God doesn't understand you? Are you mad at him? Do you see yourself being angry with others? If so, look at this lesson from the cross. There is no loneliness, no rejection, no betrayal, no stress or no physical pain that you will ever go through that Jesus has not gone through himself. Many of us carry this hurt and the pain and the suffering and an unforgiving spirit for longer than we should. We keep those things with us, and that's what makes us bitter. 
Are you still carrying something that you should have put down a long time ago? Are you still holding a grudge against someone? Are you still wounded by somebody's words that they've spoken to you? Lay it down on the cross. Give it to Jesus. Jesus can handle it. And Jesus can change your heart. He changes lives. That day between 9 a.m. and noon, when the sky turned black, one of the criminals that day was changed. He saw some things in Jesus that stopped him in his tracks. He watched that day how Jesus faced death. Jesus wasn't cursing and complaining. The criminal saw the difference between one ready to die and one who wasn't. He heard Jesus request forgiveness for the unforgivable. Remember that statement last week? Jesus forgave the unforgivable that day on the cross. The prayer of Jesus that day on the cross pierced his conscience because the criminal knew he needed to be forgiven. He knew he needed saving. He realized he was in the presence of a king who is also a savior. Listen to these very simple ways to salvation today. Respect God. Some of us call out for help from God when it's convenient and when we think we need him. But then as soon as things are all right, we're right back in the same way we were again. Admit your guilt. Just like that first criminal, we cannot be saved until we first admit that we are as lost as they were. Confess Jesus. <coughs> Jesus took our sins with him that day to the cross. He paid our price. And finally, request salvation. One of the criminals showed respect for God, admitted his sin, and confessed to Christ that day. But he did something more. He requested salvation. He asked for salvation. This is a step that many of us today here have not taken. I love how he fulfilled that criminal's request that day. He went way beyond what he was asked to do. Grace always exceeds our expectations. No one is beyond his reach. You know, it kind of reminds me of Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Did you hear that? Jesus is our salvation. He alone has the authority to save. It is never too late to turn to Christ. If you have not reached out to Jesus Christ for salvation, do it now. You know, there's a story told about a famous rabbi who was walking with some of his students one day. And one of them asked him a question. He said, Rabbi, when should a man repent? The rabbi calmly replied, he said, you should be sure you repent on the last day of your life. Several of the students looked at him and said, oh, now wait a minute. We can never be sure which day will be the last day of our life. He looked at him and smiled. The answer is simple. 
Repent now. That thief that day had one chance. Just one chance, and he took it. As much as you might not want to hear it, this may be your last chance. Salvation is a choice. You can be like the one thief and experience par paradise, or you can ignore Christ and experience paradise lost. There are only two options to us. You can be pardoned, and this is harsh, you can be pardoned or you will be punished. The line of division is the cross. Those who repent and receive will enjoy eternity with Christ. And as much as we don't want to hear it, those who revile and reject will spend eternity in the never-ending fires of hell. It's that simple. And we don't like to hear that message. During my reading, I came across this little story about a cemetery. And the cemetery was in Indiana. And on one of the tombstones was written these words. And I want you to pay attention to this today because this speaks to this. Here are the words on this stone. It says, Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. There is your salvation. <coughs> so which criminal are we going to be today? Are we ready, like the one criminal on the cross, to ask for our salvation and to be in paradise with Jesus? Or are we going to go, shaking our fist at him and hurling insults? That is your choice today. These messages from the cross are so profound. We cannot ignore.